that's okay. Last week was our first week also. Okay. Well, yeah. mine, at least. I Listen. like it, though. I like this platform. It's nice. Yeah. yeah. I like the little setup you got going on there. Nice, the nice little background that you got. You, you seem oh, like you're my, prepared. This is my office. This is my office. So okay. Yo, um, we got Mastermind, the legendary DJ Mastermind in the motherfucking building. I'm to the fullest. Check it out, yo. It's another super fat mixtape. Another fat tape from Mastermind. Mastermind. You know, yo, well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Listen, thanks for, for for joining us, bro. What's the going on in the background here in your um in your scenery here in your in your office? You talking about here? Yeah, what's the plaques? Office, um, some just some accolades. Some stuff is um you know plaques from uh, record labels. You know when you're when you're a DJ and you um um and you support artists and those artists have success. Sometimes you know the only thing that labels can do is send you some kind of a recognition in, in, in hip hop and stuff. It's like plaques. And so there's some plaques here. Some of the stuff is just um, um, stuff that I've put together for, you know, keepsakes and stuff. So I got, you know, some stuff framed up from albums that I've done or mixtapes that I've done or um, yeah. from when the time I was in the source and so on and so forth. So there's some, some knickknacks here and there. That's crazy. So even like if you didn't have, like if you're not on the song, if you're not a writer or something like that, they'll still send you a plaque just from like supporting the tune. Yeah, I mean, and you'd be like, you know, sometimes like in Canada, the, the way that they make plaques are very generic and small. Mm. Like some of the plaques they make for the DJs in the States is crazy. Like they're really, it's like artwork, man. Like, um, and, and, it, and, it, and, and again, yeah, like because they know in a lot of cases, you know, the successes of these artists and these records and stuff, it's not just based off of like in 2020, you know, when you, um, you know, when you think about successes and stuff, it's like, there's so many different tools with the platforms and the streaming and all that. But back, yeah. you know, back in the day, like if you want it mid nineties, early nineties, late nineties, two thousands, um, you know, it was mixtapes and DJs and mix shows and stuff. And all those, um, all those different, components were very integral for um the success of these artists breaking them being the first one to play them yeah you know um i mean you know truth be told i should have way more than these but again when you live in canada it's never going to be like that you know what i mean like yeah they're they the, the american labels they i don't know if they do it now anymore but they back in the day they spent a lot of money on plaques for their djs and shit yeah but people are not even spending money on the physical distribution of the music so a plaque they're not even going to spend that kind of money too you know what i'm saying you, like the artists will still get plaques and the producers like like they're all still getting plaques like even last year um when artists would come to town like warner in canada is a great example like they would always make sure that you know when a boogie was at rebel that they took a platinum plaque to him mm. when uh, nav i was there when nav got presented with a plaque you know his plaques um um, I was there when Thugger got his plaques and stuff. So like they, they will do it for the artists for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, Roddy Rich. The last plaque we got was a Roddy Rich plaque. They sent it to the radio station and I left it there when I bounced. So Okay. What have you been doing during your isolation time? Not a lot. Stuff around the house. Um a lot of binge watching of stuff. Yeah. I you know I uh the COVID COVID nineteen aside, like I um you know, aside from like, you know, regular corporate type of vacations where you get a week off here and there or whatever, like I've never really had time off in the last it's the last decade for sure. Yeah. You know, to the point like and if if the if the quarantine wasn't happening, you know, when I departed with the radio station, I would have been on a beach somewhere or I would have traveled to you know, one of those places where you have to be there for three to four weeks to really take it in. And one of those places I've never been to or whatever, but with everything that happened, it kind of derailed all that. So it's, it's been a lot of just, um, you know, relaxing. Like my kids are old anyway, so it's not like I got to entertain them or, or keep them occupied. Like they're busy doing their own thing. So it's a lot of, you know, just doing stuff around the house that I hadn't had time to do, you know, when you're constantly working. Yeah. So what was your 2019 like then? Because, a lot of people now, they're looking at 2020 as a rap. Yeah. But, but like, you were, you, you've, 
DJed for so many different radio stations, last one being 93.5 The Move, right? The possibility of you guys ever getting on a track together. Well, he's in town right now. Yeah, apparently, he, he IG'd from his, his uh, condo. No, flo- well, it was called Flow. So it was 93.5 The Move for about uh, about two years, give or take. Two, two years and a bit, maybe. And then in the uh, beginning of 2018, they flipped it back to Flow. Um, so I, when I went there, it was Flow 93.5. And then about five years, five years later, they, they flipped it to 93.5 The Move. And then again, uh, when I was last there, it was back to Flow. Okay, okay. Huh. So. Oh, the name changes. A lot of flip flop going on there. Yeah, like, what's that like? Like, yeah, the name changes. Yeah. Um, well, that's all corporate stuff, right? Like, I don't own a radio station. They do research and they, you know, research comes back and tells them things that they should be doing or certain lanes that are open. Uh, um, you know, you know, one of the reasons I'm probably not there now is because I, I never necessarily saw eye to eye with, um, you know, the direction the management wanted for the radio station. I've, I've always been a hip hop um, supporter at heart and um, anything that deviates from that kind of bothers me. Right. Like I've worked at a radio station where I moved from Toronto to Calgary to launch a hip hop station. Mm. And, and within a year they had flipped it to a top 40 station. Oh, yeah. Which, which isn't which isn't what I uprooted my family for. Yeah. And definitely not definitely not move from a city like Toronto to go to Calgary for. Um and I ended up having to stay there, you know, at a at a radio station that wasn't um in my heart, um, just based on obviously work life. You know, you gotta you can't just yeah. quit your job and do nothing. So I had to stay there uh until the the stars aligned for me to come home and and actually work at a hip hop station. But yeah, I mean, you know, that's um, the unfortunate thing about commercial radio in Canada. For some reason, you know, we got the biggest artists on the planet and it's the biggest genre on the planet. But, you know, I guess the, 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 the corporate, the corporate world doesn't necessarily see the value in it. And everything's a, Everything's a dollars and cents thing. So, I mean, if it's not making money, it doesn't make sense. If it's not bringing in the ratings, it doesn't make sense. Mm. And at the end of the day, that's, you know, I, I, I can't be mad at them about that because, again, it's not my millions of dollars that's running the place. Yeah. And so at the end of the day, they're just going to do whatever they got to do to make their properties successful. What do you think that is the problem with radio as far as or how do you think radio makes money if they're not acknowledging especially in canada or specifically in canada if they're not really acknowledging the biggest genre in the world because they still play hip-hop well they do acknowledge it and that's the problem right like had you know um had the station been performing the way it should have it never would have changed to 93 five the move had the station uh, more recently um been performing at the level that you would think um a hip-hop radio station in a city like toronto um should be performing Mm. um you know i would probably still be working there because i wouldn't be butting heads with management over the direction of the radio station because the radio everything would have been great but but you know there's a lot of moving parts and different components as to how radio works and how it's rated and um and how the whole rating systems works and i have my own theories and conspiracy theories about how that you know why why does a hip-hop station that sounds just as good as a hot 97 or a power 105 in a city like toronto where you have you know where drake is from where tory's from where the weekend is from and clearly has a passionate and and vast hip-hop fan base why doesn't a radio station like that why isn't it a top five radio station? Yeah. I don't have the answer to that. I just have my own, you know, back of my head conspiracy theories because it doesn't make any sense. Any of you guys it have doesn't, any? doesn't make any sense. Any of you guys um, have any answers to maybe why that, um, you know, our radio station, our foundation radio station, the one that the only one that you might be able to hear a Toronto artist on isn't one of the top five radio stations in the country. Well, not even in the country. I'm just talking in Toronto, right? So not even in Toronto. Wow. No, no, not even in Toronto. No, if we were <laughs> like if when we were you think up. about it, people don't listen to it like that anymore. You listen to like top forty radio all day, every day. Like that's what wow. plays in an office. It doesn't play like they're not going to play hip hop 
radio in an office space all day every day you're not going to do it and that's and that's the problem right like you know yeah. when i when i listen to it i want the station to be have have a sense of authenticity and purity and i you know i listen to those new york radio stations on a regular basis mm -hmm. um and I know what they sound like, and I want it to work here. And I know we have a fan base for it, but she's absolutely right. You're never going to get Flo to play in a doctor's office. You're never going to get it to play in a dentist's office. Mm, nope. You're never going to get it to play. You know, people who get to work at their own desks and maybe listen while um, they're working at their desk off of, um, uh, off of the website or whatever, off of a player, sure, they will tune in. Um, but... It, it really is an uphill battle, you know, from 10 in the morning until 5 o'clock when you're battling against the the stations that are all playing pop music and top 40 music and, and what people would consider um, more palatable music, right? Like, we all come from a generation, I want to believe, um, we all come from a generation of, um, of, of growing up with hip-hop. And so we, yes. you know, regardless of what we've moved into, um, in our ages now with, you know, corporate, somebody works in an office who, uh, you know, uh, types code all day. Mm. They, at heart, they're still a hip hop fan and they'll listen to hip hop when if they're in their car or on the weekend or whatever, but maybe they're not allowed to, you know, they work in a bank, for example, they're never going to play flow in a bank. You know what I mean? And it's yeah. like, um, and, and, that, and that's where we end up taking the hit. And so, you know, when you look at, at corporate and they're they're going to be like well we got to play these crossover records that are going to maybe get us a shot and and the problem with that and one of the reasons that they had to change the name of the station to 93.5 the movie is when you dilute the product and it goes from being a genuinely all hip-hop radio r&b radio station to now playing crossover stuff it's not the same radio station. Mm. No, no, no. And so you can't arguably say, you can't call that station flow if they're going to play, and I don't have like Sam Smith, for example. Or Katy or, Perry. Or, or Calvin Harris or Katy Perry, yeah. which have all been played on flow at one point, right? And so um, those are some of the, the corporate reasons as to why things would happen. You yeah. know what I mean? and. Um, I was really excited when they finally flipped it back to flow in in um, at the end of uh, well when they actually went hip hop it was still called ninety three five the move and that in and of itself is you know an, another issue there but um, they still they went back to hip hop twenty four seven in the end of October of twenty seventeen okay but they never they never actually called the station flow again until a year later which is really weird right so. There was there was missteps along the way and stuff, but and then also, you know, from the time that they were the move until 2017, a lot of things changed. You know, streaming came up. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the 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 explosion of Toronto hip hop fan base happened. Like you know, prior to that, with the you know, I was even I was there when you know bef the weekend. We would do we would do research and stuff, and even guys like The Weeknd wouldn't test well yet. You know what I mean? It took a long time for with Canadian audiences. Really, you're saying? Yeah, with him to connect. Like I mean, sure, the core base was all in when he was releasing House of Balloons and all his projects and stuff. Yeah. But when you think about people who listen to the radio, they took a lot longer. It wasn't until um, the the Earned It track, the one from the movie, mm. that people were like. Oh yeah, I really I like this guy now. You know what I mean? And it then it's it weird hot. how right, but it's it's also weird how the listening habits of people are different, right? Like you think about moms with their kids and they going to school and a lot of these people their exposure to um the music is strictly through radio. Not a lot of them are waiting up at midnight to hear Drake, you know, drop his scary hour records and shit like that. It's yeah. it they're not on the cusp of it. They're just listening they don't. They're not the ones that are giving a shit about um, hearing, you know, the new records right away. They, they when they become hits is when they care about it. Yeah. Uh, listen, I, I, you know, with our interviews because this is the first time that we're interviewing you. We yeah. usually do a whole, you know, where you're, where you're from, history and all that. But I don't feel like we need to go through a whole DJ Mastermind backstory, especially okay. with 
our brothers from um, Views Before the Six, you know, big up to Big Tweezy and, and yeah, Thrust. Yeah, yeah. They, they, those guys did a very thorough job interviewing you. I suggest for the people to go and take in their interview to get the beginning to end from your history from doing college radio to now, you know what I'm saying? Right, right, right. So right. Uh, we don't have to go through like the, um, the East End side and all that stuff. But what I want to know with breakdancing, mm. because the breakdancing came up in a lot of different interviews that I was peeping with you. Right. What was your sickest breakdance move? Mine? Yes. I was not, I was not, like I was an all right breaker. And, you know, I wasn't the guy that was definitely going to go in the circle and blow away anybody or anything like that. Yeah, but we all had um, the move that was like, no matter what, I mean, I could, go to move. I, yeah. I, could, I, I, could, I could worm all right, but I did, at one point I perfected a move where I would do some, some, uh, I don't even remember what they called it. Some body rocking on the ground. And then I would flip into a head spin. And then I would, <laughs> and then I would come down into a backspin. And that was pretty much the extent of what I was able to, was it backspin? Fuck or a head spin? <laughs> anyway, I, I, I always wanted Is to, be able, I, I always wanted to be able to windmill and I could never get it properly without having to keep pushing off. Like, you know, when those guys are just flipping around, and their arms are folded like They're this. Tucked. Yeah, I, I was never, They're I was tucked. never able to, I was never able to get the tuck. You got to pull off their shirts. They're windmilling. They're taking off their shirt. Yeah, those guys show off. But yeah, yeah that windmill. Yeah, you have yeah, to man, get the right, the, the right um, K-way jacket so that you can get a good slide on. But not just that. You needed momentum, and for some reason, yeah. I couldn't swing my legs to get the momentum proper. Man, it just didn't work for me. It's a weird twist. <laughs> but it. You, it like when you see the people who are able to do it, it's it's a it's a thing of Phenomenal. beauty. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's 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 athleticism. Yeah, and man. It's, it's I, amazing. And you think even, dance is appreciated in hip hop? Say again. Do you think that like dance is still appreciated in hip hop? Oh, well, I mean, it is when you think about things like the two C slide and stuff like that's dance, mm. right? And so it has its component. I just don't think the, you know. And, and the parties have all changed too. Like no one wants to go to a party. I, it's interesting actually. They'll go to a, a, a they'll go to an event and they'll make a circle for people to rage fight each other. But they don't want a circle for a guy to come in and, and bust moves and stuff like that. So yeah. it definitely has changed. But I do think that um, dance has always been an integral part of hip hop. Like when you think about every, just think about there was a video. A few years ago where a guy did like dances from like the 80s all the way up and like half of them ended up being like hip-hop dances so the dougie and and um you know the, the whatever the the soldier boy one was like there's always a dance every year right and now what, what was the one that happened it was the you know freddie you don't dance you don't dance don't, me i can't dance, dance for shit i can't dance don't, <laughs> like don't do that so i had to get it off sorry <laughs> but, yeah, but there was there was um what was the one dance that just recently where the girl got it big on TikTok and then and then they had a bunch of different girls do it at NBA All Star oh and, yeah and they and they just the, I forget what the, the dance is called but like she finally got her credit Italian? after the fact right they finally let her do her thing but I'm saying like it, you can see how how um. And then even Isn't look at the TikTok the, girl, the TikTok dance or something like that. But even or, Megan, even Megan Thee Stallion, the the the, the one, um, the the one that's happening Savage. right now, or where Captain I'm a Hulk. Savage, it's right? Because I'm a Savage, and then there's the the baby Captain girl, Hulk. the the baby show me something one where everybody's mm -hmm. doing it in the line. Like dance is just so intertwined with hip hop, like you can't escape it. So. I don't know if I answered your question about it being not there, but I really think it is still there. Maybe just in a different way. It evolved or devolved or whatever, but it's still there. Yeah. Ron Nelson. Yep. Right? He's he he put you onto radio first when you were like 15 years old. Right? Younger than that, but yes. What do you think that he saw in you? Because like, first of all, one, how the fuck do you get into radio? Like you explained the part in your previous history story of getting into the radio station, but what do you think he saw in you to be like, yo, give you a chance? What I was such a huge fan of his, like he was like a God to me mm. um, when I discovered hip hop and, and he, you know, he was on a pedestal basically. So he knew how much I admired him and how much um, he influenced me. And, and I almost, I almost wanted to emulate everything he was doing. Right. And so, 
um, it wasn't like, you know, we met and then all of a sudden he put me on the radio. It was like I, I was on his street team for a long time. I was uh, in like I would call it interning because back then it wasn't interning, but I was like shadowing him at his radio station, just watching what he was doing. Yeah. And so we had we had a relationship. And then at some point when I I guess when I got brave enough, you know, I, I slipped him like a pause tape of, of things I was doing, of mixing I was doing or whatever the case may be. And he heard it and, and, you know, one thing led to another and he probably saw it. Like back then, especially when I was 12 and 13, I was mad hungry and I um, I was very extroverted. Like I, mm. I was going out of my way to try and um, um, just get put on. Yeah. Right. And um, and and I maybe he you know, you can look at it two ways. Either he really saw my persistence or he got fed up with me bugging him and he just said yo let me give this guy a shot or whatever whatever regardless of which reason what the reasoning was you know he he was the guy that definitely put me on the radio uh, on cKln which in then turn helped lead into me getting my own radio show at chry yeah and like to fast forward back to like the radio's um history to now right you were doing yeah. that show with Ricochet, um, Made in Toronto. It's the Made in Toronto Takeover, no joke, Jigsaw. <laughs> Currently, yes. So Ricky hosted the show. Ricochet hosts the show, uh -huh. and I curated the show. So I came up with the concept of the show. Okay. When we flip back, when we flip back to hip hop, you know, we would. Uh, I was also at, at the radio station. I was also the assistant program director. I was the music director, and so we would always be in meetings, and we were always trying to come up with ways. Okay, how do we? How do we do something bigger than just playing this music? How do we reach out to the community or to the the audience and and be a part of it? And, and you know when when I when it became apparent, which was probably um, in late 2016, early 2017, or mid 2017, where I was seeing um, I was seeing a, sh a big shift in how. Um, local hip hop was being uh, um, accepted in the city because mm -hmm. I, I've, I've grown up here and I come from the state, the era where um, we don't support our own. We don't care. You know what I mean? Like we never think our shit is good enough. You know what I mean? Yep. And so I, I came from that. And then when I started to see that there was these artists who, you know, their records were getting played at concerts, I'd be like, yo, and there's the, the crowd is singing these people's records and like, they're not on the radio. They don't got, videos like that like there it's like there's a, a new a discovery method of of toronto hip-hop and there's a fan base for it so these artists are 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 getting known and my daughter at the time uh 2017 so she was probably still in high school and so she would always come home because her, obviously when you're in high school you're you're on top of everything first yeah and she'd be telling me about certain artists and i'd be like wow you like that and she'd be like, yo, he's popping, blah, 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 blah. So she was on certain artists way before they started popping. Yeah. And so she was almost like my street A&R in a way, right? Like she'd be, yeah. she'd be putting me on to people and I'd be like, okay, okay. And so when we were coming up with these strategies of, you know, what, what are the things we can do? One of the ideas was um, showcasing Toronto talent. Mm -hmm. And how do we do that? And so, you know, you brainstorm a little bit and one thing comes, you know, leads to another. And then we were like, oh, shit, you know, March 6th is Toronto's birthday. Why don't we just play all Toronto artists all day? It's never been done. And it's it, it's a tribute to the, the city. And it's, I remember that you're, you're, you're going to give people who never in their wildest dreams ever thought about being on a radio um, station a chance to be on a radio. And, you know, sure, you're going to play the Drakes and the Weekends and and the, the bigger artists, but you're, we literally, I remember I was in Egypt when we, uh, I was on vacation when we launched, when we launched the idea live. And, um, um, and I was away and then we opened up the submissions. And when I came back, I had like, I think when it was all said and done, we had like, like 3,000 submissions, but when I got back from vacation, <laughs> there was like 1,700 emails that I had to go through. Wow. And it, and, and, um, and it was just, a, it was like a labor of love, right? Because it wasn't anything, I wasn't getting anything out of it. I wasn't getting an extra paycheck. It was part of my job. And it was just, it was something that I was very passionate about. And so the Made in Toronto Takeover initially started out as a, 
um, one day, all day event. So at six in the morning, we started playing nothing but Toronto artists and it went all the way until midnight. We had artists in for interviews. Um, again, you know, playing people that never had a shot ever getting played on the radio before. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and that was still when it was 93, five, the move. And then after that happened and, you know, the radio, we, everybody was feeling great about it. It was a great day. It really was a really monumental and exciting day. And um, The ratings you know, probably went up like crazy. I don't know about ratings. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to say um, because you got to remember, like, the people that are into that kind of thing are super passionate. But the people who get the, the ratings meters and things, they're regular working people and they may not necessarily care about Oh my God! You know I'm hearing all Toronto artists all day, so it's it's a it's it's hard for me to say that the ratings went up because you know it. it I think it was a I think it was popular mm -hmm. and it was an important day. Like you could feel the energy in the city that day. Um, and then we did the second annual, so that that happened, and and I was like, we need to start doing it every night, and we. Ah, oh, fuck, I can't remember. I think the initial plan was, the initial plan was to launch, so after the Made in Toronto, I wanted to launch a nightly program. So we did the all day one, right. and then the next the next day, we would start doing it every night. So at 11 o'clock, uh, Monday to Thursday, um, it would run it at 11 o'clock to midnight. Right. And I think we didn't do it because, again, A, the station was still called 93.5 The Move, and they had some on-air talent that didn't quite fit what we were doing. And it didn't make sense for one of those people to host this really hip-hop and cultural Toronto kind of radio sh program. Right. And so it took a long time until we finally got Ricochet back in the building because he wasn't there at the time. And once he came back is when we were able to kick off the nightly program mm. and we did the second annual um so we we so in 2018 the station in february 2018 the station went back to being called flow and then that next march so the, <coughs> a month later we did the second annual uh made in toronto takeover which was also a fucking amazing day it was a great day yeah. and and i think ricky at that point had been hosting the all night program and um I eventually got them to agree to let it be a five nights a week show. So it ran Sunday to Thursday. The only reason it didn't run Friday and Saturdays is because we were um, uh, we had live to airs from clubs on those two nights. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And so we couldn't run it. And so Ricky hosted the show, and I curated the show. So I dealt with all the submissions. I dealt with uh, picking the records um, that were submitted, going through them, and and, and you know there was. It was a, a me, me and Ricky came up with kind of a scale system where it's like, okay, we, we wanted to have a, um, a standard, a level where it's like, you can't play everything because not everything is going to be good. Whether it's the rapping is not up to par or the production wasn't up to par or the quality of the actual piece of work was not up to par. Yeah, yeah. Sonically. Um, and, and so we had a bit of a scale level where we were like, um, okay, this record is good enough to get at least one play. And so we'll give them a bligh. We'll let them, we'll let them get on the radio, right? Make them, make them, allow them to have that feeling of, holy shit, I heard myself. And that was a big deal. We used to get videos and IGs all the time from people like ecstatic, like waiting to hear their record on the air. It's a big deal. Just, it's a big deal, right? It is like, a big deal. You can talk about some of the biggest artists on the planet and they'll be able to tell you verbatim everything they were doing and where they were the very first time they heard themselves on the radio. And that was a big thing that we wanted to, um, to give to these artists. We wanted to allow them to have that. Yeah. So there was, there were some artists that you get a blah, you get one record, you get a one spin, right. And then you're, and then you're gone. Unless of course we saw a, a pretty organic, um, reception to the song. Like people were genuinely liking something and maybe we weren't aware of, or there was some, there was some sort of organic thing happening with that artist or that song. Mm. And then there was other songs that were already, we knew about them. We heard about them. We really liked them. There was, there was the artist was putting in the work. You could see from their socials that maybe they were doing shows. There was stuff happening yeah. and they would kind of get put into a bit of a rotation, right? So if the show was on five nights a week, you could probably hear that record every two, no, I would pay every three to five days, give or take, right? Because yes. we wanted to get as many people on as possible, right? Yeah. And in, um, in an hour, you'd probably get to play about anywhere between 
14 to 17 records, depending on how long records were, right? Some people would submit a song that was only 90 seconds long, and other people would submit a record that was like three and a half minutes, right? So we would try to get as many as we could on um, and, and rotate through them. And then Ricky would always, after a show, he would highlight the records that he really liked because while he was doing the show live, he'd be listening, he'd be watching socials, he'd be paying attention. And so he would send, like when I got into work the next day, I would see the list and he'd, be, he'd show me which ones should stick around and which ones might need to go. Yeah. And, um, and so it was, it was definitely a partnership, but I, I, I definitely curated um, the pro, but it wouldn't have been it, like, I don't think anybody but Ricky could have done that show. Like the amount of work that he put in researching the artists, connecting with the artists. And, um, and when I mentioned labor of love, it really is. And then you still, <laughs> you know, we still have to deal with that. Poor Ricky, he dealt with it more than me. But, you know, we still have to deal with the knuckleheads who don't understand the business part of the radio, of record, of the music business. Please talk about that a little bit, please. Yeah, please. So, there's, there's guys, that, you know, there's people who um, all they know is get to the studio, um, spit a verse, make a song, and then get their boy to shoot a video for a couple hundred bucks and put it out on YouTube, right? Mm -hmm. But they don't understand the concept of radio edits. They don't understand the concept of, you know, maybe your song is only cool to you and your boys. They don't understand the concept of being bigger than your block. So, you know, um, putting in the work to, like when you, like I, I, I would have people that say to me, well, how come I'm not, how come I can't, I can't get played throughout the week? How come I'm hearing XYZ artist during the day, but I'm only getting played on a takeover. And I'm like, so on any given time, like radio station is structured with categories and, and, and certain songs in every category get a certain amount of spins every week. Yeah. And so you're kind of telling yeah. me like, I should take out Tory Lanes to put you in, <laughs> or I should take out the weekend to put you in. Yes. Like that's what you're telling me. Yes. Like you should just leapfrog, <laughs> you should leapfrog all the work and all the, all the stuff you need to do and just get into rotation like that's not how it works man like yeah. you have to benefit the radio station just as much as the radio station is going to benefit you mm. and so if i'm playing your record between um i don't even know what the, the, big, the biggest records are but let's just say post malone and travis scott and then all of a sudden the canadian record comes on that nobody knows and then that's how it's supposed to go it can't go like that it's got to be good record after good record after good record or, or a record that somebody knows or whatever and it's like yeah, follow a format yeah yeah and and so what ricky really had to deal with these guys who because again submissions would come in i would listen to the submissions on a daily like every day i would come in and you know there'd be like 30 emails waiting for me to listen to and this is on top of everything else i gotta do i gotta do a four-hour radio program i gotta schedule the music you know 24 hours of music every day mm. and then i gotta listen to these emails and then pick the ones that are going to work. And I got to put those into the system and then schedule them. And it was a big production. And so, you know, certain records would come that I didn't think were good enough. And these guys would get in Ricky's DMs. Um, and sometimes they would get really aggressive on the on the thuggery about, yo, guy, you'll play my record. And the problem was that Ricky was also, he's, he's out in the club. He's a club DJ. Because right? he's also yeah. a club guy. And so he was outside, and I'm not going to say exposed because he's never like that, but he was also available for these guys to come up to him. It's more accessible. Like, more accessible, right? So he was accessible. Right. And so, you know, I, I, I hated the fact that he had to deal with some of this bullshit because these guys don't get it. It's like, you can't tell a guy that their record isn't. Everybody goes in the studio, makes a record, thinks they're, they're the next superstar. Mm -hmm. Nobody goes into the studio thinking they're making a pile of garbage, right? And so... The unfortunate so thing is, the unfortunate thing is, there is garbage. For every Drake, there's probably 20 guys that suck, right? And for every, um, you know, if there's tiers, you know, if you go Drake, The Weeknd, Tory, and then below that, you would have like a Pressa, a Killy, an Anders, uh, you know, the guys that are next on the come up or whatever. Mm -hmm. For every one of those guys, there's still probably 30 guys that aren't even on their level yet. You yeah, know what yep. I mean? And so. 30 you know we're talking about 300 we're talking about guys that are putting in like a, a tremendous amount of work that have management teams who know how the, how the business works 
and and some of these young guys don't even they don't get it they don't understand you got to make a radio edit they don't know what words they can't say and can say mm. and it's not my job you know for free to school you on the music business i mean if you want to hire me as a consultant and pay me sure but that's something else and that's also a conflict of interest i i can't get paid by you to tell you how to get on the radio when i'm the guy picking the guys to get on the radio that's called <laughs> payola and you get fired for that yeah. you can't do that right so okay and, stop for a second yeah let's go there payola yes payola. because you've worked okay. in the radio stations for years yeah i and i, I from my knowledge from behind the scenes in the, in, in, in the industry, I know a regular hit song usually costs close to like $200,000 to really become a hit. In the States. How much payola have you seen in your lifetime? I haven't seen any. Because it's, illegal, it's literally illegal in Canada. It's right? illegal everywhere. <laughs> no, but it's... It, no, but it, it's it, like legally illegal. It's a lot here. Yeah, it's, like, it's, it's a lot. Yeah, radio stations lose their licenses. You get charged. It's all that type of shit, right? Fines and all that stuff. And yes, that is the same thing in the States. However, they found workarounds over there where they would hire um, a record promoters. So the record labels would hire a middle guy mm -hmm. and they would pay him the money to go and deal with the DJs and, and finesse the DJs and get the DJs and the the radio programmers and get do ever whatever they got to do to get ads and stuff. I have never, I have never seen anybody get paid. No DJ has ever talked to me about getting paid. Now, what have I have seen? I've seen people get trips, get flown out to conventions. Mm. When you're out at you get dinners, you get you know you get access to the artists. You get there's perks and stuff. And I'm sure there, are, I'm sure there are people that have seen money. I have never witnessed it in my 30 plus years ever. Yeah. And again, nobody is dumb enough to do it so blatantly. It would have to be done through like four or five guys, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What? And so, and so, as far as in Canada is concerned, if it's ever happened, it's never happened on, A, on my watch or anywhere that I've ever seen. Mm. And so, if somebody has stories of that they paid somebody or whatever, like I would have to hear them from that person, yeah. right? Yeah. Now in the states, yes, there's tons of middlemen. There's guys who are they call it working records and all that shit. And a lot of it is relationships, and I'm sure a lot of it is greasing and all that stuff. But again, like I said, I've never seen any of it. Yeah. And I was never, I was never approached by any of it because again, I've my whole radio career has been in Canada, and so you know, they know that we're. I wish. Listen, I wish Payola worked out here because. You know, for the way they have the, the Canadian content system set up here, it's almost like they should pay radio stations to play some of the garbage that they have to play. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like they like when you think about what rock and pop and country has force fed us over the years, not because everybody loved it, but because this is what the record labels were putting out and this is what radio station thinks the audio is the best of the best to play. It's like you know, they they might as well have paid us to do that stuff yeah. and, made it legal, and made it legal. At least, you know, when I when I noticed records getting big in the states, like if you were a Canadian artist, and I'm not even talking um, just urban music, I'm talking in general. Like, um, if I ever saw a record or heard a record getting played anywhere outside of Canada, I always chalked it up to like, wow, they really like this record because mm -hmm. there's no CanCon, there's no payola happening. They're like, it's not like you know, like I remember I was in Jamaica and um, this was the Bubba Sparks times. And I think Cardi did a remix over to beat or no. Um, he had a remix with Bounty Killer on um, Bacardi slang. I think it was or something like that. Yeah. Mm. And I was at my resort and they were they had IRFM on or something like that. And the Cardi record came on and I was freaking out. I was like, holy shit, they're playing this here. And that was like one of the first times I ever heard one of our artists outside of the right. country. And again, I chalked it up to, you know, they really like it because yeah. they don't have to play this. They don't have to play this here. There's nobody so strong arming them. Like yeah. Yeah. Over the years, right? You've like, seen, um, and even like to bring it back to our city, right? We asked this, this question to all our guests. 
Um, and we've made montage videos off of the answer that we get back from our guests that hopefully that we can get a difference going on in the world with or in the, our city with. Yeah. What do you think that we can do to bring down the gun violence that has gone up in this city over the last two years? I don't get it. It's it's mind boggling to me. Right. And I know it's I'm not from that world. And so I, I it's hard for me to even speak on it. But as a father with kids, um, as a person who, you know, for the for the majority of my, you know, my life has been involved in um, this culture and this scene, um, you know, I did see violence myself. You know, growing up, I saw plenty of shootings and 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 stuff like that, but not to the degree that it is right now. And I and again, because I'm not um, immersed in that world. I, it's hard for me to speak on it, but I, I don't understand the concept of just pulling up on, on people and just shooting at will. Like, I don't, like, I had never, <clears throat> you know, like, never thought on a Saturday afternoon in broad daylight that people would just buck off shots on Queen Street or on mm-hmm. Young Street or whatever. And it's just, you know, right, we used to deal up. with stuff like that on Caravan on Friday at midnight when the crowd was so big that something would pop off and someone would shoot up in the sky or whatever. And then everybody would start running. But this is just, um, you come, you're walking down the street and shots ring off. Like it's crazy to me. That's brazen. And I wish, I wish I had the answer, but it's, it's hard to even like, even the people I think that are close to that, um, um, you know, that, that life, it's probably hard for them to convince these kids to not do that stuff. And I, I, I don't even know if it's kids. Like, I don't know. Are these guys, you know, are they all 20 year olds? Are they younger than that? Are they older than that? Like, I don't get it, man. It's just, it's heartbreaking really, because what also happens is when you think about our culture and hip hop and, and it's so intertwined. So you even have these same, the same people that are doing all this gun business, they end up jumping on records and rapping about it and talking about what they did or whatever. Then you have a radio station like flow that they all want to be on. And then you have a corporate, a corporate structure that looks at that and is like, like, I remember when, um, when the kid, what what was the kid's name who had the the come outside record? K money and cat. Um, yeah. K money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The guy was about to bust, right? He had this record. Mm -hmm. Everything was popping. And then, then the whole thing happened with the, I think it was the car chase. No, it wasn't that. It was the uh, the thing with the the women. There wasn't he doing like. Uh, oh, he did that first. Oh, the human trafficking. The, the human trafficking, trafficking right? That, that happened first, right? So, and and yeah. we had and we had a a woman on our management team, and she was she's very strong, willed, and she's pro woman. And how do I? And when. She found out about that, and we had him up at the radio station. I think he came in on that first Made in Toronto day, mm. and we were really, we were really supportive of him. Um, you know, he brought his sister up there. I think he had his brother with him, and it was just one of those things. Where we were like, "Yo, this kid's about to bust." I think Charlie B was managing him at the time, or some sort of um, there was some sort of something going on there. So you kind of looked at it like, "Okay, this kid, like, this, he's got a fan base with the record. Things are happening," and then, and then all that other stuff happened. And then at that point, you can't be like, oh, this guy is in the Toronto Star uh, brought up on women trafficking charges. I can't go. My, my boss is going to see that. She won't want to support. And that's like when shit happened with R. Kelly. We pulled all the R. Kelly shit. So what would be the difference, right? And then hmm. when and when you and, but it affects the entire culture. They look at rap with such a broad brush it's like so when something like that happens and then a shooting happens and then a rapper gets murdered and it's always they the headlines you see it all the time it's like they can't wait to find these guys mug shots they can't wait to find a youtube video um the the whatever the youtube video him you know in the in the in the trap house with the guns and the money and blah 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 that's all they want to that's that's what they want to um and uh, uh highlight Right. And it affects the entire culture of hip hop because it's so negative. Mm. Same thing when when you any superstar like um, what happened. The other, there was something that happened like recently, like 
fuck, I can't even remember. There's so much, there's so much shit that happens. It's hard to even keep track of it all, right? Yeah. And it just it makes hip hop in general look so bunk, man. And it's terrible. I hate it. Yeah. And I, I don't know if I went on a diff, you know, a different tangent no? to your question or whatever, but it's like I I don't have an answer as to why. Like why why does that happen? And why is it so connected with hip hop culture? It's really disheartening, man. Yeah. Well, listen, man, we, 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 we appreciate you having like these conversations with us because even expressing your frustration shows that like it, it can at least let people know that a lot of people feel the same way. Like uh, it's not something that we're all ha that we're happy go lucky with. You know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah, no, of course. I don't know. I don't think anybody is. It's because there's when you think about, you know, what everybody's end game is, right? Like everybody you know, wants to achieve the successes of a Drake or a weekend or a uh, Tory where you get to move out of whatever your your situation is and, and hopefully take your family and your friends and go on to doing something bigger and better and, and moving away from anything negative and stuff. And I would assume that all these artists who are, are trying to get into this game, like that's what they're trying to do as well. Mm. And And in order to achieve that, you have to make grown up decisions. You have to say, I got to, there's certain mans I got to cut off or, um, there's, there's, um, you know, certain places I got to move from. And, and then the other problem is, as we know too well, that when you start getting or achieving a certain level of success, that a lot of the jealousy and envy can rear its ugly head. And that's where some of the bullshit comes from too. Right. Because yeah. sometimes man don't want to see yep. you win. They don't want to see you win, right? And when you're winning, they they catch feelings and they want to hurt that. They want to stop. The, they want to stop your winning. And cut your wings. And yeah, and that's that's a big part of it as well. Which red eye mentality. Yeah, yeah, I don't know if that'll ever go away. Man, masterminding the motherfucking building, yo. Mm -hmm. Listen, I want to hold you for a quick moment. All right, yeah. we have something called smoke and mirrors. Mm 